From advertising to software as a service to data. Across all of our programs and clients, we've seen a 55 to 65 percent open rate. Getting brands authentically integrated into content performs better than TV advertising. Typical lifespan of an article is about 24 to 36 hours. If we're reaching out to the right person with the right message and a clear call to action, then it's just a matter of timing. Welcome to the MarTech Podcast, a Ben J. Schaap LLC production. In this podcast, you'll hear the stories of world-class marketers that use technology to drive business results and achieve career success. We'll unearth the real-world experiences of some of the brightest minds in the marketing and technology space so you can learn the tools, tips, and tricks they've learned along the way. Now here's the host of the MarTech Podcast, Benjamin Shapiro. Welcome to the MarTech Podcast. Today we're going to discuss how relationships with smartphone carriers are becoming more relevant for marketers. Joining us is Adrian Veldheis, who is the Chief Revenue Officer at Mobile Posse, which is a platform that uses native device content discovery to turn telecom companies into mobile media leaders. Notably, their firstly mobile technology is a suite of services carriers build into smartphones to create engaging experiences without having to use open, load, search, or wait for content. And today, Adrian and I is going to talk us through some of the changes in smartphone usage behavior and new location data. Okay, here is my conversation with Adrian Veldheis, Chief Revenue Officer at Mobile Posse. Adrian, welcome to the MarTech Podcast. Ben, thanks so much for having me today. It's great to have you here. I'm excited to have our conversation. And honestly, this puts me back a little bit to my eBay days. When I first started working in marketing, I was working for eBay in the business development team. And my responsibility was to go do what at the time we called portal and partner relationships. And it was basically all the fixed placements on OEM carriers and with some smartphones trying to get things like desktop icons onto the desktop because the most important real estate a marketer can have is the first screen experience, or at least that's what we thought back in the day. It seems like you work in a relatively similar medium. I'm sure it's more sophisticated than desktop icons on HP computers around the world like I was managing. (laughs) Tell me a little bit about you, your company. Uh, What do you guys do? Yeah, what a long, strange trip we've been on, right? It's been a decade since the desktop icon marketing strategy. Well, the more things change, the more they stay the same, I guess. So in many ways, the idea of being first, having a sort of first shot, first impression, still incredibly relevant. And it has been certainly for advertising, marketing, and really just reaching consumers for, you can imagine, you know, the importance of the front page of the New York Times. What could be more influential than that? So we're certainly firmly in that space at Mobile Possum. We do work with U.S. mobile carriers and increasingly have aspirations abroad. But our premise really is understanding carriers' needs and their desire to reach their consumers and consumers' desire for content and a rich user experience. And that starts with the moment they unlock their device. At that very moment, so often, more than half the time, based on our research, they really don't have any particular goal in mind. They don't have any real reason to unlock their device except entertain me, distract me, give me a little bit of information. So we've built a platform and service that really serves that need. This goes back to the marketing 101, the four P's of marketing, which honestly, I'm so far removed from college that I'm not sure I remember all the four P's, product, placement, positioning, price, pandemonium, something. (laughs) There's all sorts of P's. Positioning is one of them. Yeah. And my biggest takeaway and one of my biggest learnings from the experience managing the relationships at eBay was it really matters staying in front of people and having a fixed placement, a place where somebody can go and know that they're going to be able to find your services and basically being there when they're making the decision how they want to operate with their device. If you can stay present and get more impressions, you're more likely to have business results. Talk to me about how the experience for consumers has changed with the rise of smartphones being sort of the default device. There are no real desktop icons. Those placements move around. What impact has that had on consumer behavior? Well, I think that that's a great observation that while our behaviors certainly have changed as mobile consumers, the devices really haven't. Ever since the launch of the iPhone, the sort of native user experience is largely unchanged. 
everybody's greeted with this sort of sea of static icons. And maybe you get a little notification that there's something for you to go investigate. So our premise has really been to try to enrich that experience, try to be a little bit predictive and proactive, and basically allow users to immediately get a payoff, which you know, in our consumer economy and consumer kind of culture really resonates with a lot of us, probably anybody who's on Twitter and is constantly watching for what's the next message or what's the next feed or what's the next thread that's going to come up. We're all certainly familiar with that experience. Yeah, I think there's a couple things that come to mind when we talk about the placements that really matter. First off, there's the default app loading experience. One of the things that I was trying to do, like I said, back in my eBay days was just have eBay already on everyone's computer. And it's a browser-based service, so we use desktop icons. Now with the smartphones, right, the goal would be to have something preloaded. Apple isn't going to let anybody just preload phones with apps. And so consumers have more flexibility So that's the idea of what apps are going to be on your phone. And the second one is what messaging happens and what's the experience on a day-to-day basis. Talk to me about how Mobile Posse thinks about those two experiences, about the default sort of app installation, and then what messages someone is receiving and how can those be modified? You know, there is a deep history to this mindset. I was for many years at Verizon Wireless in the early days of mobile data, early 2000s. And even in those days, As a wireless carrier, we were launching mobile products and specifically messaging and then mobile portals. It was a technology we called WAP in those days, wireless access product. And just as you were kind of seeking distribution for eBay on the PC desktop, it was a highly coveted and valuable real estate to be on that launch page, that starting page, that portal page or the mobile deck, as we called it in those days. I sat next to the guy that did that deal at eBay. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I'm sure he paid a lot because in those days, we had such high expectations for the importance of this. 10 million bucks a year to have desktop icons on HP computers, which weren't even the biggest producer of laptops. It was hugely expensive. Yeah, that would have been a bargain to get on the Verizon wireless deck. Yeah. So there is a long history, and uh, you've certainly lived it and seen it, as have I. And it has evolved quite a bit since those days. And there are certainly now models where carriers will push or insert or preload apps on the device. What we're doing, and we're really trying to provide carriers with a much smarter alternative. And that alternative is to basically give, first of all, consumers the choice, which is paramount, obviously. Everything that we do and do on behalf and in conjunction with our carrier partners is an opt-in model. But basically to give consumers the choice, and the choice is to say, when you unlock your device, would you like to have your favorite news topics or sports coverage or lots of Kardashian coverage, and we do a lot of Kardashians still, present and right there waiting for you? So we personalize content so it's very responsive to what the user is interested in, reflecting their revealed interest. But to basically put carriers in the driver's seat of offering a valuable service to consumers and then giving consumers the opportunity to choose it. And invariably, consumers who try it and choose it stick. And we, as a result, we have fantastic retention rates, far exceeding anything you're else you're going to see with any app out there. And we have a great monetization model because users now consuming the content, generating literally billions and billions of page views every single month. And it is that first impactful image and message that a user or consumer sees when they unlock their device. For a long time, in those days, it was advertising.com, but a really important product for us to, for marketers to sell was homepage takeovers. Yahoo, of course, made billions doing this. Yeah, eBay would pay millions of dollars just for Black Friday for the homepage takeover on Yahoo. Of course, right? I sat next to that person too. That was actually my boss. <laughs> Every time, right? But that concept of being first, that first impression, and it still resonates today because we know the value of it. And partly because users may not go multiple pages deep, but also because that first image that you see, as you mentioned, when you're trying to load your app and what is the first thing that you see or when you're waiting for you know, the page or you're looking for the content or whatever it is, advertising works. So whether it's brand advertising to influence someone's mindset or it's performance advertising to drive to a specific goal, being first, being front and foremost has a dramatic impact on performance. And so we're really trying to combine those aspects. It's funny, as you're saying that, you're mentioning that it matters to be first, it matters to be present. And I always thought of it a little bit differently. It's not necessarily that you have to be first. What matters is the impression count. 
And if you are on the homepage of somebody's primary device or whatever browser page they load or desktop icons back in the day, what you're doing is you're getting a brand impression for every single time they use that device. And to me, it's not necessarily that one brand impression is more powerful than the next when you have a static placement. It's more that you're ever present. And so you're ever presenting an option for someone and you stay more top of mind when you're in front of the consumer on a regular basis. It's the same idea behind billboard marketing, right? Coca-Cola does billboard marketing to keep their brand present in front of their consumers. And also in this case, it gives them a placement to know where to go buy the product you mentioned that you have this content delivery vehicle that is kind of a first user experience. Talk to me about some of the usage behavior that you've seen with consumers and what's the way that the behavior has changed and how does location data actually play into that? It's interesting. So over the many years, of course, in this business, the fundamental driver has been evolution of technology, obviously, faster networks, faster devices, making mobile devices just an indispensable part of everybody's tech. We all know that story. Along with that has been this increasing availability of location data. And I'm sure you have experienced the hype cycle of location for advertising. Certainly, I've lived through that. The story of you're walking by a Starbucks and you're going to get a discount code on your device. You ever hear that story before? Oh, uh, God. You know, the <laughs> Apple beacon every time I walk by the Apple store and it's like, hey, did you know that the Apple store? No. Yes, I know there's an Apple store. It's bright with an Apple in front of it. Stop buzzing my pocket. Yeah. The location-based data saying, where well, you're going to get an offer and a geolocated drives me nuts. Right. So there's good and there's bad to this kind of concept. And like I say, there's been a lot of misplaced hype. And there's plenty of use cases where marketers will run down a path and they'll try things, which is great because adoption is always a challenge for any new media. But at the same time, we certainly are seeing increasing constraints and pushback on location and how it should and can be used for marketers. Over the years, some of the most successful uses of location really are consistent with the way we've always used it. It's not so much about somebody being on the street corner Rather, a great example is insurance companies typically are obligated to spend their budgets in certain geographies, number one. And number two, they're also constrained in that they, because of regulations, cannot spend in other geographies. Mobile-based location, which gives real insights into where a user is really at, not just where they might live, is a tremendous vehicle to satisfy those needs. And so insurance industry has been a tremendous adopter of mobile advertising, particularly because it facilitates that sort of need to think. Yeah, I think that the notion of targeting for mobile and understanding the user behavior of where somebody actually is is relevant. We've talked a little bit about that on this podcast before, various marketing channels where you can figure out if someone is attending an event and putting a targeting list together, or if they've been exposed to an advertisement because they're within sort of a geo fence. Lots of location-based data targeting opportunities What I wish would happen was that there would be a carrier-based experience based on location data. When I get home, I want to see these as my default apps, right? My remote control, my smart home controls, my Twitter feed. And when I'm at work, I want all the business things to be present. Now, it turns out I work from home most of the time, so that gets a little complicated. But for most people, and for me, sometimes there's a traditional office as well. When you're thinking about the location data and what you've seen from user behavior, is there another iteration? And when is my smartphone going to know that I want to control my home, not my office? Well, first of all, hold on. Let me go get my product manager. He can write down those product requirements because I think something. I can email you the notes that I want. Fantastic. So we're already starting to scratch the surface with that. And a lot of services are. We're not the only ones. But because of our carrier relationship, because of being on the device, because of the user opt-in, we have this kind of ongoing dialogue with the consumer throughout the day. Uh, Users may interact with our content a dozen or more times a day, right? They've opted in. They said, yeah, when I unlock, show me something that's meaningful. So as a result, what we try to do, both from editorial curation and programming and also through personalization, we try to satisfy that commitment 
and it's obviously location for content content like local events obviously whether local deals is very popular right where's the lunch deal today that i can get fries for a dollar or a burger for two but also coupling that with time of day what is the right time of day to deliver this type of messaging so whether it's in the morning pretty straightforward but it's also the night before how am i going to dress the kids for school and like that 10 minutes before it rains <laughs> <laughs> well, we're having a pretty good snowstorm here. We're in D.C. and the snow's coming down. The federal government is closed. And I just want you to know I'm on this podcast. I'm going to tough it out just for you, Ben. I appreciate it. I'm in Northern California. What is this snow thing you're talking about? Yeah. <laughs> it's white and fluffy. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> so we're certainly trying to bridge that gap in terms of a sort of a time of day awareness and a location awareness around content. Hey, I'm a Alexa, Siri, Google type user too. And so there certainly is the opportunity for carriers to more fully embrace that mindset and bring more and more sparks to the overall handset experience. We're approaching it with content and with information and awareness and fun and games. But I think this is really just the tip of the iceberg to that broader mindset. So one of the things that I've been thinking about a lot lately, we moved into a new home finally. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. It's a long process, three years to build a home and been working on a lot of smart home automation. So my home knows when it's sunset and starts turning on the outside lights, things along those lines and understanding the context of time. And, you know, when you're using a mobile device location, seems like it's very relevant and something that is going to continue to be a point of iteration for brands, because that's something that the technology is going to understand. So we understand how that context is being understood by technology and how important it is to consumers. In our next episode, we're going to talk a little bit about how marketers are taking advantage of those changes in context and being able to understand what it means from a marketing perspective. And that wraps up this episode of the MarTech Podcast. Thanks to Adrian Veltheis, the Chief Revenue Officer at Mobile Posse, for joining us. In part two of our interview, which we're going to publish tomorrow, Adrian is going to talk to us about how marketers and mobile carriers are intersecting the mobile unlock screen. If you can't wait until our next episode and you'd like to learn more about Adrian, you can click on the link to his LinkedIn profile in our show notes. You can send him a tweet. His handle is avdutch, A-V-D-U-T-C-H, or you can visit his company's website, which is mobileposse.com. Just one link in our show notes I want to tell you about. If you didn't have a chance to take notes while you were listening to this podcast, head over to martechpod.com, M-A-R-T-E-C-H-P-O-D.com. We have summaries of all of our episodes, contact information for our guests. You can sign up for our once a week newsletter. You can even send us your topic suggestions or your marketing questions, which we'll answer live on our show. Of course, you can always reach out on social media as well. Our handle is MartechPod, again, M-A-R-T-E-C-H-P-O-D, on LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, pretty much everywhere. And if you want to reach out to me directly, my handle is Ben J. Shap, B-E-N-J-S-H-A-P. And if you haven't subscribed yet and you want a daily stream of marketing and technology knowledge in your podcast feed, in addition to part two of our conversation with Adrian Veltheis, Chief Revenue Officer at Mobile Posse, we're going to publish an episode every day this week. So hit the subscribe button in your podcast app and check back with us tomorrow morning. Okay, that's it for today. But until next time, my advice is to just focus on keeping your customers happy. Thank you.